think that developing a culture of positive emotional health is probably now becoming one of the most important priorities. Children spend approximately a fifth of their week in the school environment. So if that environment is healthy from a psychological and emotional perspective, an environment where uh, young people feel they're able to talk about emotions, that they're able to express emotions, that there's a cultural respect within the classroom, then there's a strong possibility that a child will take that emotional health away with them. Well, I suppose the first thing to see is and look out for is a change in behaviour. Sometimes people behave in certain ways and it's to do with a temperament issue or a personality issue and they can be quite enduring qualities over time but what you're looking for is a change in behaviour. Someone who was quiet, who's now a bit more irritable, someone who was happy-go-lucky, who's now a bit more stressed and that change in behaviour is usually an indication that something is amiss and obviously we think about childhood, we don't think that feelings and articulation of feelings is something that comes naturally to them. So oftentimes what you see might be an indication of something that seems quite different to the behaviour that it exhibits. Something like anxiety can come across as anger, something like, something like sadness can come across as just being quiet or withdrawn. So you're looking for a change in behaviour that really stands out to you as being different and this change in behaviour must persist over about a week or two so it seems that it's consistent and over time not just a bad mood or something having, having a bad day. So if you're worried about someone who might be experiencing a mental health problem, it's helpful to think about it in three ways. We all do three things. We feel, we think and we do. And oftentimes what we see first is the doing. So that's the behaviour and that will change. To explore that a bit further, it's to try and get an idea of what the child is thinking. So a child whose grades might be slipping, if you ask them about how they feel, how, what are they thinking about that? They might think I'm rubbish, I'm useless, I'm not really good at that. And that's an indication that perhaps there might be something uh, amiss with how they're feeling. And so then you go a little bit deeper and you can ask about how they feel about something. And that might be they feel sad, they feel lost, they feel confused or they feel anxious. So if you think about it, oftentimes we need to go, first we observe behaviour, then we question about thinking and how, how they're interpreting an event and then it's deeper questions around feeling and oftentimes that's when we will uncover something of a, a mark or a signpost to some form of distress. The thing we tell teachers, especially primary teachers, is they're really worried about people thinking they've got all the answers to everything but to know where the boundaries are and if they see something that's outside the boundary in relation to behaviour, to literally say to parents, I don't know, don't diagnose, don't try and use terms that you know, are out of their area, but ask the parents to have it checked out. And the usual way would be, bring the son or daughter to the GP just to see if there's anything there or not. So it's done in a non-threatening way. And then ask the parents to please come back and tell us, the teachers, what we should or shouldn't be doing or what we should be looking out for because we can then give feedback to the parents who can give feedback to the doctors or whoever the therapists are going to. I think there's a struggle for teachers in terms of if they come across a mental health problem in a child as to how they go about responding to it. Well, first of all, ask other teachers who are involved with this people if they're having a similar experience of them and create a kind of a an interest in this child in terms of across the board. I would also maybe speak to their parents and see if they're experiencing something similar and trying to see if this behaviour is of concern to the parents also. After that, if you have any worries around somebody, there's usually a community uh, CAMS clinic, which is a child and adolescent mental health service, which is a HSE service located in most geographically around the country. Usually a call into those professionals and asking them, they may indeed be able to provide some advice to you. Mass test we did yesterday. Remember, not everyone did it. Uh, Grace, super duper. Ellie, super. Nine out of ten. Wait, which one did I get wrong? Um, just the fractions question. Yeah, but don't worry about that. That's really tricky, isn't it? You yeah. did really well. Well done. Asha, there you go. Seven out of ten. Well done. Super duper. Eight out of ten. Well done.
Ellie's quite a typical childhood warrior. What you've got here is a young person who is striving for perfection and anything less than that is kind of becoming intolerable. Uh, the way in which Ellie's reacting to her mark, which is really good, is that it's not enough for her and she doesn't know what enough is. So she's checking out with her teacher if she can do better and if so, how does she do it? In this situation, from the teacher's point of view, it's really about reassuring Ellie that 9 out of 10 is enough. And in fact, it's really good and for her to value what she has achieved rather than the one mark that she missed. Uh, as it's a, an issue for most of us that we will always focus on the bits that we don't get right. Um, but in fact, tolerating imperfection and being able to cope and respond to life events without getting upset or distressed about it is really important. So the teacher's role in this situation is to try and minimise her distress, but also contextualise for her that she's achieved something really good here and that she needs to focus on that rather than on the bits that she's missing out on. What we tell all about parents and teachers is to value effort, not outcome. Whatever you put into something, it's the effort that you put into it that we need to recognise and that the outcome is only a consequence to that. So for teachers who are worried about students who are hypersensitive to criticism, it's about focusing on the effort, not the outcome. It's not about points, and especially in smaller children. The issue shouldn't be about grades, it should be about the activity and engaging with the activity and what they got from it. And what you're trying to do is to improve their performance and their awareness of their own abilities, but do that in a way that obviously that they can understand. For young people, uh, being emotionally healthy involves essentially three things. It involves being able to be happy, believing in themselves, or learning to believe in themselves, and then thirdly, feeling safe. So uh, you can see how emotional resilience is core to all of those things. And to, to try and overprotect our children and, and, and ensure that they don't experience trauma or, or negative things uh, is unreasonable. Uh, on the other hand, exposing them too much to negative experiences is also not going to be conducive. But they need to be able to cope and learn how to cope with difficulties and to enjoy the good times. And that's really what resilience is about. It's your spelling test. I just want to see that you've tried, okay? The second thing is, don't worry, I'll be saying the words twice for you. I'll say it once, and then I'll say it once again. Okay, so number one, who can spell explain? To explain something. Who can spell explain, Grace? E-S-P-L-A-I-N-E. -E. E explain E. Oh, without the E, but we've got it right. Oh, good go. Well done. Uh, who can spell, ooh, maybe a tricky one at the end, terrified, if you're terrified of someone or something. Shh, hands up. Cara? T-E-R-R-I-F-I-E-D. I-E-D, yeah, terrified, tricky ending there. Again, in the case of Leah, this is a very similar event that you would hear parents and teachers recall in terms of young people that I would have met over the years. And um, this situation here is if we look at it, there's a spelling test being presented to the class at this point, which is a kind of a public spelling test. And it's at this point that Leah begins to misbehave. She begins to become disruptive and distracting in the classroom. And ordinarily this behaviour will escalate to the point of the young person being chastised by the teacher or asked to leave the classroom. In this instance, some young people will describe that as a relief. In Leah's case, she may be really worried about her ability to perform in the spelling test, and it can be for a number of reasons. There may be an issue around learning, around spelling, with dyslexia that maybe isn't hasn't been identified and she hasn't gotten support with at this point. In the case of Leah, it's oftentimes better to be known as the class clown than someone who isn't able to do the spelling test. And so the misbehaviour, which pa parents and teacher interpret as a child being naughty, disobedient or bold, is actually a child who's trying to survive in very anxious circumstances and doesn't want her inadequacies or failures to be um, demonstrated in front of her peers. So we have to look for the meaning behind behaviour, that oftentimes it's not what it seems. And we could say she's being naughty or difficult and she needs to be sanctioned for that. Or we could take some time to ask her why and let's try and put these two pieces together and see if we can help Leah to manage her spellings rather than be sitting in a corridor. I have a willingness to open up the place for conversation. And you can open up that place for conversation and change a culture in a school or in a family uh, only by being able to accept the reality of stress and a difficult reaction to it. In that setting, 
a child who may be depressed now or even unruly or underperforming or um, acting in a misbehaved fashion, acting out as we'd say, may even be a good thing because they're the child, they're the children that you might actually have the opportunity for the conversation to happen with. They're in a way able to send the message that the conversation might open up and if you provided the conversation opportunity there is an opportunity to have that conversation. I worry more about the kids who don't talk, the ones who are silent and don't tell their friends, the ones who are silent and don't talk on social media, the ones who maybe even continue to be rather good. It's probably um, true that they're also under stress but they're not having opportunities or access to that conversation. People, when I say this to them, say, but I haven't the training. I, I, how could I have that conversation? How, I, I'm going to do more harm than good, they say. The answer is no one is ever harmed by having the mental health conversation. But many people suffer because they didn't have the opportunity. And schools are places where that opportunity needs to be created. In terms of managing a group of young people after a major incident like the death of a parent or a fellow pupil becoming seriously unwell, it can be really difficult for, for teachers. And again, you're trying to get the balance right between acknowledging the event and what has happened, uh, but not labouring it. And you need to get the balance of what that group of, of young people are cognitively able to hear. So they may just need superficial information about what has happened and be encouraged to support their class member who may be there and may be struggling a little bit. But again, you don't want to isolate or you know make a feature of that child and what they're struggling with and um, an older child may be able to tolerate more detail around what has gone on and maybe more direction but it's pitching it at the right level between uh, not laboring a, an incident and making it too intense but not brushing over it either and getting that balance right and trying to coach the class to manage together encouraging kind of teamwork activities and things that they can support each other to do uh, rather than getting into the minute detail of what has happened A teacher's role is crucial. We just have to reflect back on our own childhoods, on our own school experience, and we can all remember the teacher who spoke to us nicely, who gave us um, a compliment, who told us we were good at something, and that lasts. So the teacher's role cannot be underestimated. I think the, the real success of good teaching is when uh, a, a positive emotional um, learning and a positive emotional culture is integral to the teaching environment. Teachers are absolutely crucial because tiny little details, they can boost self-esteem, they can do all sorts of things without even the young person being aware of it. So they are one of the key elements. Now they're not mental health professionals, they're not there to diagnose, but just in the normal run of the mill, they will actually be able to boost a young person's self-esteem and ego and all that kind of stuff very, very easily. I think teachers often underestimate their connection with young people that they have. Many times young people come to the clinic who are brought here by parents as a result of a, a teacher asking the right question. We know from studies in Ireland in the recent years that the most protective thing about for young people's mental health is having one good adult in your life, a good enough person who's interested in how you are and will be there to help you. In many situations that can be a teacher and you can play a pivotal role in uncovering someone's distress and helping them to seek help for it. Uh, there is a movement now in the UK to start studying the introduction of mindfulness, for example, as part of a school curriculum. And I think it's wonderful to start thinking of our education as more than a chase for points or particular academic achievements, but the formation not only of a whole human being, but a whole human being with mental skills. And that kind of conversation will emerge from a cultural change in the school that's committed to a conversation about the stress, about the distress, and actually a willingness to invite not just those who are noisy about that, but those who are at the back of the class and may be quiet about that. We think parents picked all these things up. Most of these are picked up actually by schools and teachers. Teachers are actually doing this without realising it. But many teachers are really frightened of crossing that line, that boundary. And what we're actually saying to them is, you don't have to be frightened to go right to the boundary. You don't cross it. You then just hand it to the parents to give to the professionals. And if they step in early enough, 
um, they can actually prevent huge amounts of problems later on in adolescence. So we, we really actually encourage primary teachers not to be frightened of sitting down with an 8, 9, 10, 11 year old and just in very age appropriate language literally asking them um, how they are and if they find anything unusual feed it back to the parents immediately.